Good morning, everyone. This is um, uh, Dr. Mark Erkin, and it's uh, welcome you to our Friday morning uh, journal club. Um, uh, it's a, a pleasure to introduce our speakers this morning, but before doing so, I would like to call attention to the upcoming uh, virtual session of the World Congress on Thyroid Cancer, which is scheduled for Saturday, October 16th. Uh, that promises to be um, an extremely informative and uh, perhaps somewhat controversial session um, that I uh, would recommend that all of you interested in this topic uh, attend. Um, if you follow the link uh, to the um, thyroidworldcongress.com, uh, you'll be able to um, find information to be able to get access to that program. Um, so with that, uh, it is really a pleasure to introduce our discussions, our discussions this morning. Uh, this morning's presenter is Dr. Everett Van Velsen, who is an endocrinologist in training and a PhD student in the Department of Internal Medicine at the Erasmus Medical Center in Rotterdam. His research is conducted under the guidance of Professor R. Peters and is focused on prognostic features in differentiated thyroid cancer. Um, one of his fellow countrymen, um, Dr. Eric Berberg, is this morning's uh, discussant of this um, research uh, pr um, uh, presentation. He is a professor of translational nuclear medicine at, um, also at the Erasmus University of Rotterdam um, and a consultant in nuclear medicine in the Department of Radiology and Nuclear Medicine at Erasmus Medical Center. He has conducted a large number of clinical trials and is extensively published with well over 220 publications. And so um, this morning's uh, discussion uh, will follow um, the uh, presentation of this paper. And um, I, as always, encourage all of you to send in your questions and we will do our best to get to them uh, by the end of the hour. Um, and so before we start, I just want to uh, thank um, our colleagues from um, overseas uh, for carving out the time to present this morning and uh, look forward to um, a very educational hour here. So uh, ben, Dr. Van Velsen, um, all set here. Thank you. Okay, so well, good morning and thank you for the introduction and for the invitation to sell, tell something about the research uh, about finding the optimal age cutoff for the TNM staining system in patients with differentiated type cancer. So I have nothing to disclose. So um, the data I present here is based on our recent paper which was published in, uh, in thyroid. So um, in 2018, the eighth edition of the TNM station system, system was introduced in clinical practice. So the main difference with the previous seventh edition is was that the, um, well, the removal of the uh, minor exothyroid extension for the definition of T3 tumors, and also that uh, level seven lymph node metastases were no longer as N1B, but, but are now N1A. But also that the presence of lymph node metastases are no longer um, staging up to stage three or stage four, but now, um, no, they were into, into stage two. And also that the definition, uh, the T4, eight tumors are no longer stage four, but are now stage three. But what's, what's a very um, big difference is that the age cut off, which was in the seventh edition, it was 45, has now changed to 55 years of age. Um, so, and this age cut off was based on three studies showing that in age cut off of 55 year, years of age led to better prediction of the disease survival in patients with different thyroid cancer. Um, however, these studies were performed using the histopathological and staging criteria of the seventh edition. So that, that does not necessarily mean that it also holds for the eighth edition. So there were several studies that compared the performance of the seventh and eighth edition, and the majority showed superiority of the eighth edition. Um, however, these um, studies were mainly performed in patients with febrile retard carcinoma, or there were only a small group of patients with folic retard carcinoma involved. Um, so there were only three studies that specifically looked at the uh, folic retard cancer patients, and two of them um, showed superiority of the 8th edition. However, the other studies showed no differences between the 7th and the 8th edition. So, um, so today, there were no studies that um, investigate whether the age cutoff of FTC and PDC are in fact similar. So therefore, the aim of our study was twofold. First, we want to investigate 
the optimal age cutoff for the TNM system to predict disease drift survival, employing the uh, histopathological criteria of the current age edition. And second was to examine whether there are differences with regard to the age cutoff um, between a patient with PDC and FDC. So uh, what we did, we combined two databases from, um, well, from two centers from Europe. So first, our, our own Arrested Medical Center, which is in Rotterdam in the Netherlands. And, and next to this, we um, had data from the University Hospital in Würzburg, which is in Germany, as you can see here on the, on the map. So from our own center, we uh, retrospectively included patients with PVC and FTC, including rural cell carcinoma, between January 2002 and December 2016. And these are all adult patients who underwent thyroid surgery. Um, and from the University Hospital of Würzburg, um, we included patients between January 1980 um, and December 2015. And again, all adult patients that underwent thyroid surgery. So from the um, patient's records, we obtained demographical and disease characteristics, including the TNM staging. Um, and also the, uh, the obtaining treatment characteristics. Um, and also the survival status, including the date and, um, and also the cause of death. So the, after we reclassified patients using eight editions, um, histopathological and staging criteria. Um, and then we, um, we applied different age cutoff. First, we used the model without, uh, without an age cutoff. And then we, per five year increments, we, um, between 20 and 85 years of age, we um, well, two different cutoffs. So we had a cutoff of 20, 25, 30, 35, and so on and so forth. And for the sensitivity analysis, we also used uh, per one year increments between 35 and 55 years of age. So we had a lot, lot of different age cutoffs. And then for the statistical analysis, we, um, for the disease predict survival loop, we used the Kepler Meyer method. And um, thereafter, we uh, looked at the statistical model performances of the uh, of the different models. And for this, we use the uh, concordance index, the C index, and the AIC and the DIC. So the, uh, the DC index says something about the goodness of fit of the statistical model, while the AIC and the DIC says, say something about the relatively quality, uh, uh, statistical quality of the model. So we got a, a model with a, with a highest C index and the lowest AIC and DIC, you get the um, optimal performing model. So we did this for the, for, for the models with the different age cutoffs, as I described in the previous slide. And then we did it for, for differentiated type cancer, so the whole group, and also for PDC and FTC uh, separately. So um, we obtained 3,074 3, patients, of which one third are from the rest of the medical center, and the other two thirds are for the, um, um, the, the, the hospital in Würzburg. So if you, if you look at the baseline characteristics, you can see that the uh, mean age of the patient was 49 years of age, 70% uh, of the patients were female, 77% uh, of the patients had preparatory uh, heart carcinoma, and the other 22 had follicular heart carcinoma. Um, at, at presentation, already 9% of the patients had this metastases. And if you look at the mean follow-up, it was uh, 84 months, so approximately seven years. And during follow up, uh, 467 um, patients died, uh, of which 133 due to thyroid cancer, so about 4% of the total population. So, this 10 year disease clip survival was um, 95% for um, the whole population and 97 for PDC and 90 for FDC. So, that um, to suggest that there's a significant difference between the survival of um, Polycar and, and papillary thyroid carcinoma, and it was indeed the case. As you can see here with the, with, with the Cox model. Um, so that was unadjusted, but also adjusted for age and sex, and also the model three for, for, for adjusting for the cohort where the patients come from. So patients with follicular thyroid cancer had a higher risk of dying, at least in our study. Um, so here you can see the um, distribution of the patients um, uh, over the different stages, and well, in the in, in the upper panel, you can see where we use no age cut up. So um, the majority of patients uh, had stage one and almost one quarter had, uh, had, had stage two disease. Um, and then if you, if you apply an age cut up, and there were, of course, more patients in stage one. And when, you, um, when we increase the age of the age cut up, then 
and well, they, they get more space in stage one and less space in the other stages. And this holds for both for DDC, but also for PDC and FDC separately. So, which can here you can see the graphs of the uh, well, of the C index, the AIC and the BIC um, to look at the statistical model performance. And what we saw is that the majority um, of the XGDAF had a, a better statistical performance than the model without an XGDAF. And that's the model that you see on the here on the y-axis, which you can see here in blue. That's the, 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 the line of the um, of, of the model without an XGDAF. You can see that um, the majority and this PDC, the majority had a higher, um, higher statistical, uh, had a better statistical performance. Um, so when we use the five, five year increments, we, we, we show that um, both for DDC and for PDC, the optimal age for us was 50 years of age in our population, while for FDC, this was uh, 40 years of age. And then for the sensitivity analysis with the one year increments, we show that it stays the same for. For DDC, well, it was 48 years for PDC, and it was uh, 41 years for FDC. So a minor change, um, um, minor difference between the five-year and the one-year increments, but it's approximately the same. So if we then look at the change um, in, in stage of the, of the patients with uh, comparing the current 55 years uh, age cutoff and our newly found 50 years or 40 years cutoff, you can see is that there's um, the patients that were in stage one uh, for DDC were upstage into, into the other stages. Um, so for DDC approximately 4% of the patients changed states while this was stages while it was uh, for PDC that was um, approximately 3% and it was 12% for FTC because it was mainly because well we changed from 55 to 40 years it was a bigger step than for 55 to 50 years. Um, here you can see the, the, the survival curve, but on the left side, again, the, the, the current um, age cutoff, and on the right side, the optimal age cutoff. And well, the main difference, especially for DDC and PDC, is that there's a little bit better uh, separation between the curves than it was before. Um, and what stands out for follicular type cancer is that there's um, well, a considerable overlap between stage three and stage four. As you can also see, as there are no there are no statistical differences between these two these two stages, suggesting that for, for FTC maybe it's better to use three instead of four stages. But I will come back to that later. So then we compared um, the we compared both centers. So at the Russian Medical Center in Woodbridge University and Hospital, um, we had, had approximately the same age distribution, but what you can see is that um, there were substantial um, more patients um, with lymph node metastases and distant metastases of presentation at the Western Medical Center. Um, and you can also see is that um, more patients died from due to thyroid cancer at the Western Medical Center, probably caused by um, well, a more severe um, thyroid cancer group because we are a reference hospital um, for a large part of the Netherlands. So if you look at the um, survival, you can also see this, that, that probably therefore that the genuine disease for survival at uh, threat medical center is a little bit lower than it is for the um, Brookstock University. Um, and here we, 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 here we also look at the, um, if there was a difference in age cutoff between the rest of medical center and the Brookstock University. Uh, hospital, and you can see here is that um, for the five year increments for DDC, the optimal age cutoff for the investment center was uh, 40, 45, which was 40, uh, 50 years for the Woodstock University. And if you look at the one year increments, it was um, 47 and 50. So, well, it's a small difference. Uh, for peptide heart carcinoma, this is also well the same. Um, while for follicular heart carcinoma, you can see here is that there's no difference between both centers. So both uh, the 40 years and the 41 year increments with the, the 41 years. So there's hard, there's no difference for follicular thyroid cancer between both centers. So um, well, what are the strengths and limitations of, of, of our study? Now, first, one of the strengths is that we have a relatively large proportion of patients with advanced um, disease state compared to other studies. Because in, in a lot of other studies, you can you see that in Especially in stage three and stage four, there are not 
that many patients. So they, yeah, well, you don't you can't you can't say very much about those data. So that's that's one of the um, strengths of our study. Further, also the relatively high proportion of patients with polyvagal cancer enabled us to compare um, popularity for the cure type cancer. Further, uh, while well, the patients were recruited from two large university medical centers uh, from Europe, and although um, you know, the Netherlands and Germany are, are, are very close to each other and as a country, the, the, the guidelines are a little bit different and also the patient population are, are somewhat different. However, um, getting, getting two populations with minor, different, with minor differences can also increase the robustness of, of, of the data and therefore increases the generalizability of, of the study. Um, one of the limitations is the it's a retrospective study in which the pathology had to be reclassified using the criteria of the eighth edition. Um, and because it pains for early classified in the sixth or the seventh edition, and well, it might be that this reclassification difference differs from direct classification using the eighth edition, but of course it was impossible to, to do a pathology revision for, for, um, for, for all the patients. So well, therefore we have to, we have to live with this. Um, and further, further, there's also the possibility of differences in treatment among the patients over time, because well, you saw that they were included from, from 1980 to, towards uh, a few years ago. So well, so it means that the, the treatments or aggressivity of treatment changes over time. So it might be that that leads to some some bias. Um, well done for the for the discussion. So um, well, as I said, there were only minor differences between the results of the five-year and the one-year uh, agreement. So it was the 40, uh, 40 against forty-one for FTC and the fifty against uh, forty-eight for for PDC. So therefore, we think that um, to, to make it more easier for the clinician, we go for the results of the five-year agreements because it's probably easier, easier to remember that it's 50 years and then it's 48 years or 48 years for, for the age cut off. So therefore, here we, we go with the results of the five-year agreements. Um, further, um, well, we found no significant difference between stage three and stage four for FTC, as I said. So that's probably caused by patients with four tumors um, that, that have reversed prognosis in our study. And we also saw that in our earlier study, um, um, in, part, in the part of the overlapping population, um, and this might suggest that maybe for, for, for FTC, um, three instead of four stages can, all, it can also be uh, possible. Um, but further research in this, in this, you know, also in other populations that uh, have to be performed. Um, and then the um, well, and then the age cut off. Um, well, there are some some studies showing that there's a linear relationship between age and 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 and, and type cancer mortality. So, and they suggest that well, they then just put the um, age cut off, getting a recumbent model. Um, well, you, you don't um, um, get a good result. However, we showed. That the majority of the uh, well, of the ASCDF went better than the model without an ASCDF. So, so therefore, we think that an ASCDF is is at this moment, um, yeah, well, it, it needed to better to get a better classification. However, it might be that this just this, this single ASCDF is not the best way to apply age in the end stage model because you might think of is instead of having one age cutoff like now, you probably can have two age cutoff or maybe cut off so maybe three, or you can um, put some some kind of risk score or use um, relative survival uh, rates uh, into this. So I think research is needed to see if, if it's like it is now, it's if that's a single age cutoff, it's the optimal model, or there there are other ways to, to put age into the DNA system. So in conclusion, so the addition of the age rate cut off increases the prognostic power of the TNM system, and the, um, in the overall optimal age cut off to predict disease survival employing the histopathological criteria of the current age edition is 50 years for PDC and 40 years for FTC instead of the currently used 55 years of age. And our results suggest that PDC and FTC should be states as separate entities. 
So here you can see our, our proposal for, well, maybe for the ninth edition, um, having the cutoff for 50 years for PDC and 40 years for FPC, and further we didn't change anything about the, about the shaping, so just the age cutoff. So what's, well, what kind of free research would be very helpful? Well, I think first that uh, our results should be confirmed in, in other populations from across, uh, well, from around the globe, because, well, we just have studies from Europe, we didn't include a uh, population from, from other countries. So I think that's, uh, that's very important to also see if, it, if this holds in, in other populations. And further also, like I said earlier, um, research into the, at least in our study, the, and the absence of differences between stage three and stage four for FTC. So we, we'd like to see if that's also the case in, in other populations. And further, um, as I said, well, it's worthwhile to investigate whether there's a better method to incorporate AIDS into the DNA system. So finally, I want to thank the, um, well, well, the people that made the study possible, especially Nina Stega for the help with the data collection at our own center, and uh, Professor Peters and Professor Verbrug for the guidance um, with the study. And of course, I want to thank you um, for your attention. And if you have any questions, please write them down in the chat and then we can answer them later on. So, now, so I'm going to go, be talking about some problems and pitfalls with staging systems. Now we've uh, heard Dr. Van Velsen's intimate, uh, detailed analysis on some of the more nitty gritty details of them. First of all, my disclosure. I'm a consultant to ISAI, I have speaker honoraria from Sanofi, and I have research support from ISAI. And as a first example, I would want to talk to you on the value of big databases, especially the study on iron 131 as a nuclear medicine physician are, of course, close to my heart. And big databases certainly did play a role in showing the potential benefit of my mainstay of research and mainstay of clinical practice, especially very well known, the big US Army database analyzed by Matt Safari and Yang in 1994, which basically showed that there was a high difference in recurrence rate and mortality between those who received post-operative radioiodine therapy and those who did not you might all be familiar. And similar results were seen in a collective from the Mayo Clinic as published by Ian Hay and colleagues, as you may see here. And furthermore, such large databases are able to, for instance, show important information such as that uh, most thyroid cancer patients have a normal life expectancy with exception of stage four patients where you can see that the observed life uh, survival is markedly lower than the expected here in the, in the dotted line. But all other stages have a normal life expectancy. Very important lessons which can be learned from big databases. Now, let's go on to staging systems. First of all, let's be talking about what staging actually is. And staging, in the end, is the estimation of a particular risk and this risk needs to be defined. It can be a primary outcome such as tumor-related death, or you can use secondary outcomes as a proxy for uh, the primary outcome, which are, could be recurrence, treatment, success or failure, etc. And by actually putting a patient in a staging category, we're categorizing the individual patient. So we're defining a population of uh, continuous risk uh, spectrum into discrete uh, limited number of groups with a comparable risk. And by doing so, we also immediately try to stratify a patient in or towards a particular line of treatment and follow-up. In the end, probably instead of staging systems, you could rather name such systems prognostic scoring systems. Now, staging systems should have certain requirements. A patient should, of course, be uh, stratified according to the individual risk as accurately as, accurately as possible. It should be easy to apply, and you should preferably not have to use high-tech or expensive obs or observer-dependent uh, parameters. 
and they should be universally accepted. They should facilitate comparison of populations and they should facilitate an exchange of information between various centers and physicians. Now, this is not as easy as it may sound. Um, quite a number of groups have concerned themselves with big database analyses in order to define such prognostic scoring systems and there are well over 15 such systems in literature and ju that's just the ones with death as an endpoint. And then most of these are developed on the population of a single hospital. Some have been somewhat empirically designed, and then you're talking about TNM or the NTC CTS system. And not all of these have been developed or validated for differentiated thyroid cancer as a whole. Some of them have been designed particularly for papillary thyroid cancer. And as you already see, saw in AVID's population, this might not entirely apply uh, or not entirely apply in the same manner to F follicular thyroid cancer. It has already been known since the 1980s that um, you, using systems defined on a particular population um, might not necessarily apply to another population. The same methodology used on a different database will produce a different staging system. So if you have another population, your system designed on a hospital A might not apply to hospital B. And there might also be ethnic issues. If you look at, for instance, the system defined by Katie, um, this defined males as being at higher risk, but the system defined by Noguchi defined females to be at higher risk. And then, of course, if we're looking at another outcome, such as recurrence, um, you will need to design a different system because the recurrence has different determinants than death. They might be similar, but they're certainly not the same. And for this, you should look, for instance, to the ATA system defined in the ATA guidelines of 2015. Now, the many comparison, the many staging systems will, uh, of course, inevitably call into question um, how to compare these, which one is best. And in the end, there is no consensus, there is no established methodology uh, on which of such methods is definitely to be applied. Different methodologies are used in literature. Um, there have been various uh, pay, uh, groups who did such comparisons. Plasler, really, we ourselves did some uh, something uh, similar. And even when the same method is used, say proportion of variance explained, you have many different methods for calculating. And even if you are able to use a particular method, these methods require some considerable expertise to apply. You know, it's almost like being Dutch and a bicycle. So if you're going to compare staging systems, you will see that staging systems are heterogeneous with regard to many factors involved, such as the composition of the stages. And you will then therefore see that many staging systems have different numbers of stages. Some have two, some have four, some like TNM version seven had six. Um, some factors are just based on the anatomical uh, spread of the tumor. Some also involve the factors such as pathological grade, age, sex, even DNA-based criteria. And thus, and you don't need to see this in detail, you can all, it is just to illustrate that the various systems can have quite a different curve distribution, as you may be able to see here. Now, instead of using such comparison, what could you do? You can take your other option, and that is to develop and validate your own prognostic system. And quite likely, in your own center, your results in comparison will likely be better than the TNM system. Um, but it will depend on what is put in. It will depend on the method you are using. And again, there is also no consensus on how to develop or validate such a system. 
And for others, such as hospitals, um, for other hospitals, this is whatever you're producing is largely of academic interest because likely your system will not perform as well in their hands. It is not usable for comparing with other hospitals. And you will likely still have to record a TNM system to have a universal uh, communication. So personally, my recommendation would be to, in the end, work with what is already there. Work with what you have and what you can find. Now, also, when comparing staging system, when looking at staging, you will need to consider the importance of long-term follow-up in order to be able to identify more subtle effects. As already seen in the review by Amy Soka, and I'm harking back to Radio Iodine here, um, you need to have a particularly long follow-up and actually to actually be able to uh, see the uh, efficacy of radioiodine on, uh, on thyroid cancer mortality or, or on recurrence. As you can see, it's the largest populations with the longest follow-up uh, period, which actually have the highest chance to uh, actually show a significant effect of radio iodine therapy and this just to see the numbers one two and three are also the ones with the longest follow-up this is some made perhaps somewhat more insightful by um, looking at several kepler meyer curves for instance here the use of radio iodine or not in uh, a particular population of multifocal n1 r1 uh, patients where no radio iodine and radio iodine well if you're going to look at it if you really want to start seeing these curves deviate you will have to wait close to 10 years and we also saw that in another study which was looking at the prognostic effects of different uh, radio iodine activities for radio iodine therapy so in the end, it's also, again, close to 10 years before you start seeing significant differences. And I think this is, should be taken into account whenever developing prognostic systems that you need a long period of follow-up. And then, last but not least, we should also consider potential sources of heterogeneity in, lit in literature. Um, whatever you get out as risk factor largely depends on what you, on what you put in. And what you put in depends on your guideline and on the local ideas about factors such as um, extent of surgery. Do you do hemithyroidectomy versus thyroidectomy? Do you do uh, radio iodine after surgery or not? And if we're looking at here, for instance, the ENM, the ENM is fairly strict in Europe about who should get radio iodine. Um, it's basically everybody without those with a papillary microcarcinoma without metastases. If you then look at the most recent American Thyroid Association guidelines, then you can see that there is an, a somewhat different view on this. And in a very large part of the population, you get the indication consider. This is 42% of, uh, approximately of the patients that we see initially. So what do you do? It will depend on your local physician's preference. It will depend on uh, considerations other than what, in, what, what is in the guidelines. A second source of heterogeneity is thyroid ultrasound. Just to show you what's happened um, over the course of the years where ultrasound has become mo more commonly available here in Germany, which is one of the two populations where Evert, uh, his study, which he just presented, got a large part of the patients from. You saw a clear effect of screening, and you see here in a few short years, say the space of 10 years, you get a, uh, approximately a doubling of incidence in both males and females, which is largely due to the more ubiquitous use of ultrasound. Especially because ultrasound is in the hands of internists, it's in the hands of primary care physicians. Whereas in the Netherlands, where ultrasound is solely and exclusively in the hands of radiologists in hospitals where you need a referral and you have a few weeks waiting time you say, you see that the incidence um in males and in females 
only shows a very modest rise over the course of a 20-year period. Far less than where ultrasound is ubiquitously available. Now, the interesting thing is the mortality in these both populations is exactly the same. So here again is a large heterogeneity in what you put in. You get a whole different a priori risk population. And one of the new analyses Avon just did is a comparison of the Witzbock and the Erasmus population, where the patients in Witzbock who have a lower risk profile because they we, we far more often get the small tumors without metastases. The average risk of having lymph node metastases. At, in relation to your tumor diameter is is different. You you only reach the fifty percent the, the median uh, sort of fifty percent risk of having lymph node metastases at a far greater diameter because oh there's all these little microcarcinomas here which don't have lymph node metastases which we find by screening but not by chance which we in Erasmus do see. So we have in Erasmus we get a, on average far higher risk population. This again will also determine what your prognostic system will, will give you as determinants. And another factor overlooked are the perioperative factors. For instance, um, the fact whether you had a preoperative di diagnosis, um, whether you had an intraoperative diagnosis, or whether your diagnosis only came in the final pathology report greatly, uh, greatly uh, determines your chance of actually. Um, achieving a remission and those who had a preoperative diagnosis had the full package um, certainly did better, had, a, had a more favorable rate there than those who had a, the diagnosis in the final pathology report this is um, a factor which is I think is largely overlooked and we're not even looking at the quality of the surgeon in question I know the Mayo Clinic has great surgeons has excellent thyroid surgeons I know um, Memorial Sloan Kettering does I know Institut Schwein Schwif in, in per Institut uh, Gustav Rossi does in Paris I also know that I don't often see patients operated from such excellent surgeons but my, my patients usually come from what is the equivalent of say Corn on the Cob Iowa the law for the local surgeon there who does three thyroidectomies a year. This too is much overlooked as a source of heterogeneity which will also determine your prognostic factors. So in summary I would say that big databases are useful for indicative identification of potential prognostic factors but you will find that staging systems and prognostic scoring systems as well as their predictive power will vary between populations. There's no agreed methodology on how to compare factors and systems and of course there are many factors which thus far have not been investigated as properly as they should be, namely heterogeneity in screening, perioperative diagnostics, surgical factors and I think quite if you look at these factors they may, may, may explain quite a lot of the heterogeneity uh, found in literature with regard to prognostic factors in age limits, which factors go into our staging systems, which don't. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you both for uh, a really interesting presentation and thought-provoking set of um, questions for us here. I'd like to just um, start with Dr. Ben um, Belston and see if you have any comments regarding uh, Dr. Berberg's discussion? Uh, well, yeah, well, we discussed it uh, together earlier, so so yeah, well, I think it's it's it's, it's a good point that there are differences between the populations. Um, but again, I think with um, if you combine such populations, you get a more generalizable result. So I think it's it's really important to compare population different hospital and even from different countries if you want to, um, and to to get a better staging system. I think I, I think that's very important. Can you just uh, clarify um, uh, one or two points related to pathologic assessment and whether or not um, the uh, uh, whether NICTP was excluded or included in your um, in this population of patients? Um, well, I uh, because um, well, 
the, the, def the definition of nicety was also after um, her study was already closed um, <laughs> with regard to the uh, inclusion. So um, we didn't um, did a total revision. So it might be that there are patients with nicety in the study. Um, well, it might be, I, I, I think they are, <laughs> um, but we don't know which uh, patients were. So yeah, well, we, we can't do any, anything about that, but it might be that it, it well, it, um, it influenced the results a little bit, maybe. Yeah, I'm not sure because I don't know uh, the percentage of the patients um, that are in the study. So yeah, we don't know. Um and the other question, follow-on question, relates to follicular variant to papillary thyroid cancer, which is commonly um, either uh, overdiagnosed, misdiagnosed. Um, do you have a sense, number one, on um, whether that entity was parsed out and whether or not there's uniformity of uh, uh, pathologic determination across both of the institutions in this um, included in this study? Um. Yeah, well, at, at least from the Resume Medical Center, center in, the, in, in the well, in the last years there were no not that much uh, pathologists in, involved. So, it, well, we hope that they are uh, well and do the same thing, same thing every time. So maybe there shouldn't be much preparation in that for the Woodsburg data. I'm not sure, but I probably Eric uh, I can that. I can amend that. It's 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 rather simple. But, um, for the, for these large longitudinal databases, we assume uh, we uh, that we get great, of course over the over the number of years. You don't just get um, a number of pathologists within your own institution. You also get quite a number of outside pathologists um, who all endeavour to stick to the, the to the prevailing WHO standard at the time. So whatever happened, we assume that it happened within uh, within agreement with the prevailing WHO standard. But as we all know, the WHO standards for thyroid cancer have, how shall I put it mildly, e evolved over the course of the past four decades. So certainly there are bound to be some classification differences. And I would personally say that um, therefore we have not really been able to, shall we say, go into more nitty-gritty detail with regard to the patholo pathology classification as we have, uh, Avert, and I think you did the same, we have kind of stuck to the overarching definition of follicular and papillary thyroid cancer, which as an overarching group have more or less persisted fairly constantly throughout the various edition of the WHO standard, of course, with the exception of the NIFT. Okay. And um, how, how um, do you have any sense on, uh, first of all, how common is it to get um, mutational analyses of uh, patients with these conditions um, and what your thoughts are with respect to including that information um, in your staging in a uh, prognostic scoring system, to use the term um, that uh, um, that Dr. Berberg had uh, had mentioned here. Well, to give my thoughts on this, it's quite simple. Um, this we did not get this routinely until a few years ago. It's only become routine practice in the last few years to actually get this information. And personally, I think. Another five to ten years will have to elapse before we can really get some long-term data on the exact importance of various mutational uh, signatures. Um, there, there was, of course, the BRAF mutation. Yes, BRAF is associated with poor prognosis, but it's not—it's not the other way around. It's not the—it's—it's it's, yes, patients with poor prognosis more often have BRAF, but it's not that patients with BRAF necessarily have a poor prognosis. Likely. Multiple factors are involved. There are some papers detailing that it's uh, that it's also about uh, hyperexpression of certain microRNAs. Um, in the end, I don't think we know the whole picture yet well enough to actually reliably define it in, in staging systems in, in this respect. Or, as, if I may quote Manuel Zabrinho Zemoes um, from Portugal, who uh, I found uh, basically what he said: No. We've tried it, but actually it's all humbug. It's all, t it's all about TNM. Even if you look at the mutations, it's still about TNM, your risk profile. 
Okay. Um, can can you talk for just a moment, um, uh, uh, Dr. Van Velsen, about inherent biologic differences um, that you might want to speculate be between um, follicular thyroid carcinoma versus papillary thyroid carcinoma, and how age might play a role in um, uh, in in the underlying biology here. Have you thought through that at all? And do you have any um, comments related to that? Um, yeah, well, what we know and what we've seen in all, all the studies that the patients with follicular thyroid carcinoma are, are, are indeed older. Um, so it might be that part of that is, is uh, part of their reverse prognosis due to that. And we know that, that, that it also spreads differently. So, so there are, um, well, at least there are usually no lymph node metastases, but sure there are more distant metastases. So, so, may, so it's probably had to do with the uh, how it's we spread um, um, through the blood, and then and then then this metastases. But yeah, I, 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 I personally still find it difficult um, why um, well, why the difference exists. But but, but in the end. Um, we know that we now know or see that it exists. So I think for this, uh, for the same system, we should, um, well, 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 take care of that and, 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 and do the staging differently for uh, both tumors because, other, because otherwise you, you can get, get a model that's really um, based on, on PDC instead of also on, on FPC. So I think that's, that's one of the different um, uh, important things. Um, so maybe for both of you, if you could just comment um, in, in, in closing here about where we go from here. Um, are you, uh, do you have plans to apply the methodology that you um, uh, developed for this research project to other databases in other parts of the world? Um, and in terms, of, as part of that, in terms of coming up with a continuum of multifactorial variables to account for um, uh, um, perhaps a more robust um, scoring system or staging system, how you might develop that. David, do you want yeah. to go first? Uh, yeah, um, so so, so when, when, when I was preparing this uh, um, presentation, I was also thinking, well, well, we should try to contact other groups in the world and to see if we can do the same. Um, um, like, like we did with this study, so so I think that's the first thing. Um, I think the second, um, well, we are now also performing um, because we now did a study on the single cutoff. So we're also looking if we can do uh, two two cutoffs and see if that's uh, if that improves the system. So I think that's the first thing we will do, and well, well, and, like I said, also try to involve the groups and look at other populations and. You combine it. I think that's that's also a very important thing. Yep, I fully agree. And um, we now have had our training data sets from two, shall we say, fairly distinct dif different uh, systems of healthcare with regard to thyroid screening. They should more or less have made the results, as you said, Ever, quite robust. Um, this is the training data set. Uh, the nature of science is that they should be tested on test sets. Um, Certainly, we will probably have to, we will be contacting in the near future various centers to see whether we can, uh, yeah, whether, whether we can amass another critical data set to actually do a test on, to do a validation. Um, I think, but this, this is not something we have had time to pursue yet since the publication. Now, as for other factors, Having been working on this topic for the past, I think this has occupied me for ever since I did my PhD research, so that's been the past 16, 17 years. Um, the more personally I get, the more I'm involved, the more I am of the opinion of Manuel Zabrinha Zemo, is that likely um, if you properly define TNM, um, that's the best we're going to get for now. Personally, I feel before we start doing further research into uh, refining her, the, the, the existing staging systems, we should first look into uh, 
better knowing the sources of heterogeneity in prognosis. The, the be, quantify the difference between this local surgeon of, of Conan the Cub, Iowa, and the Mayo Clinic. That sort of thing. Once we have that, I think then you then you have a basis to actually um, try and improve staging systems involving such factors as where was your primary treatment, or we can unify staging systems by basically, which would be even better, by making sure that every patient gets the optimal care he, she, or it needs. I think that is the secret for the future, personally. Okay, very good. Well, listen, I would like to thank both of you for um, an extremely informative uh, session here. Um, and uh, it was really an outstanding presentation. And to all of our listeners, I would like to invite you to our next week's um, session from Dr. Susan Pitt. Um, and uh, again, uh, put in a um, a word for the World Thyroid Cancer um, Congress and uh, the upcoming meeting in mid-October. So with that, um, everyone stay safe. Uh, Dr. Berberg and Dr. Van Velsen, thank you once again um, and hope that you'll join us again in the future here. Thank I think you. It, we could say it was our pleasure. Thank you for having oh. us. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much.